It's lovely to be with you and thank you so much for that kind introduction. And it's my great pleasure to spend um, the next 40 minutes maybe talking with you and then perhaps trying to answer some of the questions that you may have after I have spoken. Um, I would like to thank the organisers for, first of all, organising the event for you. I think it's so good when teachers can come together and those interested in, in this aspect of education can come together to share ideas, to share concerns and challenges that you might be having in your classroom. But I do think that together we can learn so much and we can learn from and with each other. So I'm very honoured to be part of your event. Um, I think it's about five o'clock at night for you, for me here in Scotland. It's lunchtime and it's also looking out of my window a bit of a misly, grizzly day. The sunshine has disappeared. But I hope that the next time, that little bit of time that we spend together will be uh, something that brings some light and sunshine into your um, day. Now, let me just uh, see if I can share my screen here. Uh, hang on a second. Uh, let's see. Yes, I think that's worked. And play from the start. Yes, there we go. It's always a bit of a, an anxious time to make sure that the technology works, but there we go. Just before I start sharing some ideas and some thoughts with you, I thought I would give you just a little bit of a background about me so you know where I have come from and why perhaps I'm sharing some of the ideas that I am sharing. I started my career as a teacher, a primary teacher. Um, so our primary schools in Scotland, you enter school at four and a half or five years of age. And I taught in primary schools. And during my time there, I came across children that I had to think a little bit harder about. There were things that they did or that they said that, that I was making me go, oh my goodness, I didn't expect that. And those children that made me ask the so what question, because having watched these children in my classroom, I was left thinking, OK, so what do I do? And as I've looked over my career, I realised that that little question, OK, so what? is one that has guided all of my work, really, whether that work has been in kindergarten, in primary, in secondary, or indeed in higher education. So when a new model of gifted education comes out, I think, hmm, OK, so what do I do with that as a teacher? So what do I do with that in my classroom tomorrow morning? And so as I speak, I would ask you to have that question in your head. Hmm, OK, Margaret, so what? And perhaps you might ask some of those so what questions when we get to the end of my presentation. Because I'm not coming tonight uh, to tell you what to do. I am, would never do that. But I'm coming to share ideas and thoughts um, from my experience over the last 42 years in education as a teacher and over the last 20 or um, 28 or so, particularly in gifted education. So one of the questions I think that we often ask is, who are we talking about? And on one level, people think, well, that's a very easy question, Margaret, for goodness sake. We know who we're talking about. We're, we're talking about gifted children. That's easy. We can easily identify them. Actually, it's not so easy, I don't think. Yes, I think there are some children who we um, can see in our classrooms and who do stand out to us for doing certain things. But they may or may not be gifted, but we also might use an IQ test. It certainly tells us something, but I would suggest that an IQ test maybe doesn't tell us everything. So actually, when you look at the literature, there is no one easy identification way to, uh, way to identify them. 
And there's no one easy definition either. And that, in some ways, I think, is what makes this group of learners so interesting, but also so challenging at times to work with. So, a definition might be culturally dependent. I know many of you are from Kazakhstan. I heard a previous questioner is from Moldova. So there are many countries that you might be here tonight representing. And each of your countries will have their own ideas and their own systems. And we need to take that into account too. In my country, in my country of Scotland, we use the following definition. A learner who is working significantly ahead of their peers in one or more curricular areas. And if we put a full stop and stop there, that might be quite a nice, straightforward definition to work with. But we kind of muddy the waters, as we would say, and we say, or has the potential to. Because we certainly know in Scotland that we have children who have the potential to be doing much, much more than we are asking of them. But maybe because of issues around the deprivation and poverty that they perhaps live in, we're not offering the opportunities to these children. Perhaps they're just having to work too hard to live, to go to extracurricular classes and so on. And we care about those children too. And so it's not just the children who are already demonstrating what they can do, but we are interested in those children who are also, um, who have the potential to show us what they can do. So that's our working definition in Scotland. So who are these children? What, what, what might they be doing? Well, this is not an exhaustive list, and I know that these slides are going to be shared with you, and I'm happy for you to use them. But don't sit with this checklist and tick them off and say, oh, there's one over there. These are just indicators of things that, as a teacher, you might want to pay attention to. Often, the parents that contact me here in Scotland, their children learn to read not because the parents sat down and taught them, but because the children worked it out. They recognised letters, even letters in the environment, environmental print, and they suddenly worked out phonics for themselves and they could start to read. I had a, a mum who called me one day and was talking about her child and she said, He's learned how to speak Gaelic and Gaelic is our national Scottish language. Now, not that many people in Scotland actually speak Gaelic. I don't speak Gaelic, but we do have a Gaelic television channel. And I said to her, oh, I said, that's wonderful. Do you speak Gaelic in your family? And she said, no, this is the strange thing. None of us do. And they worked out that this little boy had been putting on the television finding the Gaelic channel, putting on the subtitles so that he could read it as well, and at the age of four had taught himself really quite a complex language. It's not a phonetic language at all. So they will often learn to read earlier in their own perhaps and other languages too. This long, deep concentration particularly if it's something they were interested in. And of course, that's a problem if what you're asking them to do in kindergarten and school is not something they're that much interested in. They can have good powers of reasoning, good memory, recall. They're also the kind of child that you make a, a throwaway statement in your classroom about something. And the next day they come back in with all manner of questions about one thing that you said that you've actually forgotten that you've said, but they've remembered, they've gone home, they've asked their parents, they've found books, they've gone on to the internet to find out more about it. And they can recall that information and they can use it across different subject areas. 
Um, mathematics is often another one, although sometimes you have to make sure it really is mathematics and not simply computation. Um, we're often told, you know, my son, my daughter can count and counting is hugely important. Addition, subtraction, multiplication, but it's one aspect of mathematics. So that idea of thinking like a mathematician is also something that some of these children do. Some children can be really interested in the big questions of life. Why are we here? Why are, why are people suffering? Why is there suffering in the world? What about all these environmental issues? And now many children have access or are hearing or are, are in environments where they're hearing the news 24 seven, where they're aware of things and linked to some, some of these children who can have highly, highly sensitive um, outlook on life. These things can become quite upsetting. They can be very, very empathetic um, that can sometimes play out in your classroom where you are perhaps giving a child a row for something and they can feel that. They feel as though they are getting the row. So these highly empathetic young people might be in your classroom. Another thing I've noticed is they quite often will have a very keen sense of right and wrong, of fair and unfair. And, and sometimes as adults, we do the kind of grey area. So you, I don't know, go to grandma's for tea and perhaps grandma's cooking's not quite what it could be. And we, we as adults might say some kind of polite thing to make sure that you don't upset grandma. No, no, no. Sometimes these children will just tell grandma how they find the cooking. They don't do that kind of grey, subtle, they just go straight for it. And that can often happen too in our classrooms when we are applying rules, for example. They will have very definite views of right, wrong, fair, unfair, um, but that's not right. They also, by the way, might have that view of your teaching. I, I can think of a, a little boy who was about seven and one of his great interests was space. He knew so much about space and he was very excited because the topic, the project that his class were going to be doing was space and he thought, brilliant, I know so much. And the teacher, and I'm sure it was with the best of intentions, was perhaps simplifying some of the ideas and concepts to help the children understand. And this little boy came home in floods of tears to his mum going, but she's not right. She's not telling them it right. It's just, you know, this real, he had all this knowledge and he wanted it to be told accurately and correctly. Um, and just one other thing, they will know more than you do about certain things. And I think we just have to accept that. Get over it. Don't get in a battle with them because probably you won't win. So they've got this intellectual curiosity. They want to know more. These children can be a real challenge to work with, I think, in our classrooms. But oh my goodness, what a privilege also to work with them. As it is with all children, I, I do think teaching is a hugely privileged position. The opportunity to shape, to influence, to nurture and support young people to flourish is a hugely responsible, a hugely responsible job and a great responsibility that we have. But one of the things I've noticed is, and, and I've been, I've had the privilege of being in many um, parts of the world. I've been in Australia, New Zealand, America, parts of Africa, Europe. And a lot of teachers ask the same kinds of questions. They're in different circumstances, different legislation, different cultural um, uh, scenarios too. And yet some of the questions they ask about teaching and learning are the same across these countries. The answer might not always be the same, but the questions I think are the same. And the other thing that I think prevails are some of the myths and legends. And oh, I'm not quite sure what happened there. I think I accidentally pressed something. Sorry, my apologies. Um, so what 
um, are these myths and legends. Now, we'll all have our ideas. I don't know any of you, I don't think. My apologies if there is somebody here that I know. It's, it's good to have you. Um, but I don't know who you are. I don't know what your backgrounds are. I don't even know why you're here. Have you been told you have to come? Have you chosen because you're interested? But whatever reason you find yourself here, you will have come with some ideas. Whether you've sat down and thought about it or not, you will have ideas. And some of these things um, will be shaped by things in society, your experiences and so on. So I think this is an often forgotten about group. That for me is one of the issues. We, I think, worry rightly and are concerned rightly about the children who struggle and we should be concerned about them. This isn't either or, this needs to be everybody. Um, so there, but within that, the, the frame of thinking, they're often forgotten about. And I think it's because we think, well, they're clever, they'll find, they'll get on in spite of us, not because of us. We don't need to think carefully for them. But as our previous speaker, I think, was saying, we do need to think about how we differentiate for them. We do need to think about, somebody asked about emotional and social well-being. We need to think about this group. This is a group that I think have tremendous potential, but they've got tremendous potential, as every child and young person has potential. This group has potential for good or for not so good. And one of our jobs, I think, as teachers is to be developing the whole child. I don't think it is enough simply to think about the cognitive development of the children. We need to think about their social emotional development, their personal development, their spiritual development, their cognitive development, every aspect of them as a learner and as a human being. I think it's also interesting, and I think we've kind of forgotten about this. Some, not all, but some of this group flourished during lockdown, certainly in my country, and I know from looking at research in many other countries. In fact, if you had access and if you came from affluent enough families and had access to computers and, and opportunities, actually some of these young people flourished. Some children came back into schools in Scotland, having learned, I think, more than they would have learned if they had been in school instead of lockdown. And yet we've kind of gone back to just saying, oh, well, we're back in school now and we're kind of working through COVID. We just need to kind of keep on going back to what we did before. We can't press pause on learning. It will be detrimental, I believe, to their well-being if children are not cognitively challenged. So that's what I'm, I'm trying to say here is it's not just about how do we, we cognitively challenge them, although we need to think about that, but how do we do that alongside these other aspects of the child's development? Another thing that I think, and certainly in my country, um, is one of the issues that we face is this idea of elitism. Um, in Scotland, we don't even use the term gifted and talented or gifted education because it, that comes with this idea of creaming children of, off of this group that are terribly, terribly special. And, and, and we're, we're egalitarian in Scotland, we think. It doesn't matter where you come from. If you work hard, stick in, you can do well. And if we are egalitarian, then we can't be seen to be elite or exclusive or taking a group that some would argue are already privileged because they can read, they can write, they can count, they're thinking in advanced ways. And then they say, well, we can't give them more because they're already ahead. We can't let them be ahead any further. I think that's a very um, unfortunate way to think about this group of learners. I think it's also a misconception, as Carrie Wynne Stanley says here, for gifted education. And yet I think it's how it's often thought about. And I think um, in your school, I think one of the discussions or your kindergarten, one of the discussions you want to have is what do we actually as a group here believe about this thing called gifted education, this group called gifted learners? What are some of our thoughts and ideas and perhaps myths that we have bought into that we maybe need to challenge 
as we're developing ourselves as a school and as a nursery and a kindergarten and thinking about policies. These myths, I think, are found in, in um, across the globe. This is a, an item taken from the National Association of Gifted Children in America. You will probably, if you've done any reading in this area, you will know that actually much of the research and the writing comes from America. Now, for me, that's not unproblematic because we are an English speaking country in, in Scotland, but we're not American and we don't work like America and we don't think like Americans. Um, and I think we need to be very, very careful taking work and ideas, that idea of policy borrowing and saying, oh, what do they do? Well, let's, we'll do that here and we'll be as good as they are or, or whatever. I think we need to be very careful. But I think this, um, these myths are ones that I've certainly heard in many countries in the world that I've had the privilege of working in. I'm not going to go through them all. You can see them here on the school, on the screen rather. Um, but I think the one there in the middle, teachers challenge all pupils gifted will be fine in the regular classroom. We need to make sure that that is actually true because if it's not true, then it's a myth. Are we actually challenging all pupils. I believe that all learners need to be challenged. I believe that learners need to be taken and challenged to the point of failure, but they need to know it's safe to fail. But I think the problem is that because the one at the top there that says gifted don't need help will be fine on their own. I think because we think that sometimes we're often then not injecting the, ta the, the challenge into the tasks in the kindergarten, in the school, and so they're not fine in the regular classroom and they don't just do it on their own. They need help and they need support like any other learner. So um, other ones there that I think, well, they're all quite important actually for you to think about. But, you know, this pupil can't be gifted. They've got a disability. There's a whole field emerging in the field of gifted education within the last few years, thinking about twice exceptionality, or I would call it multiple, because I think it can be more than just two ways. But the idea of being gifted and gifted and autistic, gifted and having behaviour challenges, gifted and pick a label, any label. I would rather not label children. A label's neither good nor bad. It's just a label. Um, but I think we need to make sure that we are not thinking, well, they can't be gifted because. I think a much more helpful way is to go in with an open mind saying, OK, let's see who in my class can do more than they're doing and how much more can they do. Learning, I think, needs to be exponential. Um, we, we, I, I worry about the term full potential. You sometimes see I'm helping children reach their full potential. I don't know what that is. I don't know what anybody's potential is. Potential is keep going, see how far you can go. I did see it written on a report card once. He's working well beyond his full potential. Now, I don't even know how you do that. And of course, some of that's linked to the idea that we can measure this idea of ability or intelligence. Um, and, you know, if you can be how, how full, how, how do we measure it? How, how much of it have you got and all that kind of thing. So I think there's lots of myths that float around this area. Some of them might even be connected to your own cultural views, the views within society about these, um, about people. So in Scotland, we like to put you down, keep you in your place. And that's hard. That becomes hard to excel at something, hard to be good at something. So again, if you're thinking about this as a school, you might want to, if you're having uh, doing some continuing professional development along this, you might want to use these little speech bubbles and thoughts here on the screen to provoke some conversation. Because when you start to sit down and talk about these things with teachers, you also get to start to talk about practice. And one of the things I've been interested in in my career Career is that idea of changing practice. So one of the things we know, and, and as I was talking to the organisers in preparation for, for this, we talked about the fact we know a lot. We know a lot about learning. We know a lot about teaching. We know a lot about education. And I'm not just talking about giftedness. I'm talking generally. We know a lot and teachers know a lot. 
And yet there often seems to be this big gap. We know this is what we should be doing. And yet this is what we still do. And so we have this big gap. And I think within, <coughs> excuse me, within gifted education, young learners, learners often fall into this gap. So we know what we should be doing, but we end up not doing it. So um, one of the things um, I said I would look at was what causes these gaps? And then importantly, how might we bridge these gaps? The previous speaker mentioned teachers being really important and they are absolutely key to all of this. They're not the only um, person or, or, or um, group involved, of course, in the education of children and young people, but they are certainly an incredibly important group. But teachers work within systems and structures, and I think some of those systems and structures haven't always helped us to bridge the gap. Um, international comparative data where we're measured and then we're pitted against each other. We create league tables. Um, I mentioned earlier that idea of policy borrowing. So when the PISA study comes out or the, the TIMS, the Third International uh, Maths and Science Studies come out, you see countries looking, going, who's at the top? What are they doing? Can we do what they do? And, and one of the countries often look to, although it's interesting, its positions are shifting, but one of the countries often look to is Finland. And yet Pazi Salberg, one of the names associated with Finland in his first in his book, when it first came out about Finnish education, said this is what we do in Finland because this is Finland and you can't do what we do because you're not Finland. You might look to see and get ideas but we need to take into account that cultural context. So again, I don't know everybody's cultural context, but it'll be important, I think, for you to think about, okay, I'm in my classroom, my classroom's in the school, my school's in a system, that can Broffenbrenner kind of idea, and how do these things impact what I can do to support gifted learners in my care? The other thing, of course, that happens with these league tables is that there's a big rush to try and get to the top. Now, normally for somebody to move to the top, somebody has to move down. So you've got constant sliding scales. Or if we're all going to rush to the top, we'll all be in a flat line. And well, if you're in hospital and you're flat line, you're dead. So I'm not sure about these league tables. I think they might tell us something, but maybe they just don't tell us everything. We're also, of course, not comparing like with like. Young children and uh, start school in Scotland at four and a half. In other countries, children are seven. Um, that's quite a big difference. So again, think about your own context. How does this apply to where you are? So what does this mean for you and for your classroom? The teacher is key, but we also know that there are shortages. We know that this is not something just in Scotland. We have a shortage and a retention issue. Um, if you look across Europe, across the world, there are teacher shortages, there are teacher recruitment and re teacher retention issues. And indeed, I found online where um, the president of Kazakhstan was highlighting this as an issue too and saying a teacher is a crucial component in creating a new quality of our nation. So there's a recognition within your country, Kazakhstan, that the teacher is important. And that is really important when I think when we come to think about gifted and talented learners and indeed when we come to think about all learners. But I think what I want to flag up here by highlighting this teacher shortage issue is that that means it's hard for you who are in schools, who are, as we would say, um, harking back to the days when we wrote with chalk on a blackboard, you're at the chalk face. It, it makes it hard, it makes it challenging. And gifted learners can be challenging anyway to work with, but then you wrap around that a system that is also making things challenging. And it's little wonder, I think, that many teachers are reporting that they're tired and that they're burned out. I think the standards um, and country and school and the regulations you have will very much be important for you as you think about how you develop this. We often focus rightly on the child and the learner and what do we do, 
but we can only what, do what we do by looking at the context in which we work. Um, the physical building will restrain you. The picture there is of a, a fairly perhaps typical school in Scotland, but I'm very well aware I've never set foot in a school in Kazakhstan. I don't know what your school building's like. I don't know what your classrooms look like. And it's important that you listen and take note of what I'm saying and think, OK, but so what? My so what question. So what does that mean in my classroom? I had the privilege of being part of a European project and one of the partners was in Romania and we were working in Romania and we were talking about group work and doing things in groups. And some of us were talking about the children moving chairs, sitting in a group, whether you were sitting on cushions on the floor. Or, and I could see the Romanian teachers. They just looked, they looked really puzzled. And I can remember looking at them and thinking, oh, OK, I wonder why you look so puzzled. Are you, are you not allowed to, to let the children sit in groups? Or, then I visited a Romanian school and this particular school, the seats, the, the classroom was tiered like a cinema um, and this, the, the desks and the chairs, well, the desks were nailed to the floor. And I thought, OK, that doesn't look like a classroom in Scotland. Of course, I can do groups. My room, the tables can all be moved back. I can move my furniture. So, you know, we can have good ideas, we can know in the research and the, and the policy what to do, but sometimes there are things out with our control that mean we just, it makes it just makes it very difficult for us to do it in our classroom. The product uh, performativity aspect, of course, comes in here. Schools are often judged by how many exams children pass or when they pass and that kind of thing, and that's not always helpful. And then the final thing there, I think, is freedom and permission to try things. I think children and young people, gifted young people, need freedom and permission to try things. Actually, I think that's crucial for gifted learners. And I think that needs to start early on in kindergarten, where they're not constantly presented with things they can do that they get right all the time, but they're presented with challenging things where there is maybe no one right answer. Because if you are always getting things right, then you don't know how to get something wrong. You don't know how to fail. And I think all of that is really important as we're building up resilience within individuals. And working in higher education, we see very, very highly able young people enter our higher education. But it's a different style of learning, a different way of answering questions, and they fail the exam they don't know how to cope with that failure. So building in challenge, knowing it's safe to fail through school is important. But I also think if you're here as a head teacher or a manager, I think it's also important that you give permission to teachers to try things so that they can make things work and go, well, oh, that bit worked, that bit didn't. When I try it again, I'm going to do this. I think that's a hugely important role for managers. And managers, I do think, actually have a very important role in developing gifted education. I just want to go through reasonably quickly through the next um, three or four slides. I don't want to dwell on this, but I do think it's important um, this idea of your personal constructions about specific phenomenons. In other words, what do you think, what do you believe about giftedness, gifted education, gifted learners? Because you will have this idea in your head. You might not have been um, aware of it. You might not have, um, have, have decided this is definitely what I think, but but you will have thoughts consciously or unconsciously. About Earlier, I, I know a little bit about um, education in Kazakhstan, A, from doing readings, but B, I have the great privilege of being the supervisor um, of a PhD student from Kazakhstan. In fact, I think I saw them entering the room. Uh, Didar, if you're here, it's good to see you. And I have learned so much from Didar as he's been studying with us here in Glasgow and looking at gifted education in Kazakhstan. But that's not the same as you being 
living in, working in um, Kazakhstan. So we have to take our, our ideas, those implicit theories that we have about gifted education. Um, we have to think about um, the culture that you're rooted in and say, how does all of this affect us? Because I would argue that all of these ideas, implicit, not necessarily explicit, sitting down thinking about it, but implicitly, your views and ideas will shape who you identify as gifted. I remember being in a nursery one day and saying to a nursery teacher, have you ever worked with children, young children who are outstanding? And they thought for a minute and said, no, and never in this area. It was a very poor area. That affected their identification processes. They weren't looking for them. They didn't expect to find them. It will expect that it will influence the judgments that you make about gifted learners. And that's particularly important earlier on for young children when you've decided they are, they are not. It will affect the assessment that you do and the evaluations that you make. So I would challenge you just to think a little bit if you haven't already or, or get your staff to think a little bit about what they believe. Because, as I say, we I, uh, the, the while we identify, we will hold beliefs, we make assumptions um, and we use methods that fit with our educational um, system and ideas. So important things, I think, to think about. And of course, there are many issues um, that we need to consider, um, including gender. You know, boys act out, you see them, do, do we therefore identify more boys, etc. Um, and so we need to think about what is influencing our implicit theories. Well, if at this point you're thinking, yeah, okay, Margaret, so what? Um, then the next bit is the so what bit too. So what could we do? What can we do in our schools? And I think there are a few key things that we can do. For me, it's about bringing together research, policy and practice. These three elements need to work together if we're going to address this gap that exists between what we know and then what we do. Um, somebody asked in the, the end of the previous session what professionals should be involved. I think it, we can have subject experts involved. I think we all need to be involved. Parents need to be involved in this. It's no one person's job. We need collectively to come together. Researchers need to work with teachers. Researchers need to listen to teachers. And um, there's a wonderful book. Um, I remember a, a, a researcher who does research and inclusion had gone out with a student to school and they had watched them teach. And he was very quiet on the way back in the car. And the student said, what are you thinking about? And he said, hmm, I'm just thinking of that practice or work in theory. Because often we start at the theory and say to practice, this is what you do. But actually, I believe it needs to be a two way process if we're going to drive these things um, forward. I also think we need to work from where we are. Um, the, we need to create classrooms that, that recognise and value all learners and that means that needs to include the gifted. We can't um, ignore, inclusion doesn't ignore difference and all differences. And therefore, those who are highly able, or, or so we would call them in Scotland, or gifted and talented, they just need to be part and parcel of who we're thinking about. As we're thinking and planning learning, they need to be in our thoughts. I think teachers know an awful lot more than they sometimes think they know. And I also think you'll be doing more than you think you're doing. I remember being uh, doing a, a continuing professional development session. And at the start, I said to the teachers, I want you to talk to your neighbour and share and write down what are you doing just now that challenges highly able or gifted learners? And you could see some of them, the colour going draining out their face. Oh, don't do anything. And once we started to talk about the kind of teaching and learning that we know from research supports gifted learners, they were saying, oh, actually, I do some things already. So do an audit, find out what you're already doing. You will, I would, can you have a double negative in a sentence? You will not be doing nothing. You might need to do more. You might need to tweak what you do. But I would argue a good place to start is reviewing what you're already doing. Attending sessions like this, where you get to hear from people, perhaps from all over the world, where you maybe get a chance to talk and share with each other, hugely important. 
we need to value the interconnectedness of research, policy and practice. Very quickly, here's a, a project that we were involved in where we thought, what can we do? So what can we do? And we thought, well, research is really important. Let's help our children to be researchers. And we built on the work that was done not well, 19 years ago about children, developing children as researchers. And it was about helping them to think about um, using research methodology. In fact, if you're doing a PhD, the methodologies that we were getting these young children, and uh, they were aged about eight, nine, ten, the methodologies when things we were getting them to think about are the very things that I, as the director of postgraduate research, were getting our PhD students to think about. They had to think about analysis for empirical research. They had to generate new knowledge. They had to design an element. They had to think about validity and collect and process raw data, the kind of things you do when you're researching. Um, Experts went into school and worked with primary uh, six. So the, the children in primary six in Scotland are about 10 years old. Um, and they were given the opportunity to select and investigate a topic that interests them. And of course, we know that when you're interested in something that has a can or can have a huge motivation, uh, sorry, impact on your motivation to learn. So it was this idea that there were um, active researchers working on the, the work of um, Mary Kellett, who talked about children as researchers. They were educated um, in research skills and methodologies. They had ownership of the design and quality, and they had to communicate their findings. All important things, I would argue, for learners to be learning about. We know that uh, some of the, the challenges for the teachers, our knowledge, they were anxious about this. And that's where I think teachers can do a lot, but they can't always do everything on their own. And so I would be advocating that you work with others, either with other teachers in your school. Can you connect with universities? Can you connect with experts in subject areas? And of course, the staff from the university help them with that kind of anxiousness around, oh, I don't know if I know enough about this. Time is always a problem, I think, for teachers. We never have enough time to do the things we wanted or we want to do. But careful planning and negotiation helped them to manage their time to ensure that they did actually get to do what they wanted to do. They helped each other, so working as a team. Um, they had to carefully timetable things, so not everybody had access to IT, to computers and laptops. But again, all these aspects had to be considered within the school of how do we do this? And they involved the parents. They had to explain to the parents what we're doing because parents were a bit like, well, OK, this sounds like I am you know, a good idea, but are they going to be learning anything? Is it going to take their learning forward? And so ensuring that it did indeed take their learning forward and explaining to them why and how that happened. They, at the end of the project, said there was great benefits to this way of learning. Um, it helped with challenge, it allowed those gifted learners to approach things differently. Not everybody did the same thing, so they could come at it with the abilities and interests and depth of knowledge that they had. They were starting from their own place. It helped young people to make meaningful choices. Helping young people to make choices and make good choices is a hugely important life skill and one that I think we should be starting in kindergarten right through. Sometimes our PhD students don't make good choices. It's about helping people to make better choices and to have ownership over those choices. So pupil autonomy was important. It improved relationships. Sometimes some gifted children find it hard to work together either in a group where they are all deemed to be gifted, I'm better, my idea's better, I've, I've had that experience with young people, or indeed they, it's like, well, you can't even read, why would I work with you? But this project working helped those different groups to come together and work together better. Um, and the um, teachers reported the children were calmer, that they approached learning, they were excited, they, they had kind of got that passion again. And so they felt it had been good for their general well-being and development. But coming together, I think, is important for everybody. And so 
I would argue and encourage you to get together and to learn and share from and with each other. That picture was taken last year at um, a big research conference. Didar helped out at that conference. And um, this was a group that, that were together. Some of them are Scottish teachers. Somebody's a, a, a at that point was a PhD student. Uh, somebody else is from a different country. They've uh, two different countries, in fact, represented there. They came, they came together to learn from and with each other, learning internationally, not to copy, not to policy borrow, but to say, OK, so what do you do that I can take from my classroom and use in my country and my uh, context? Reflecting on your practice and saying, what can I change and adapt? Really, really important uh, to do that, I think. So. Um, having access to resources. Resources are not the only answer. They're part of the answer, but you need access to evidence-based resources. There's a lot of things out there on the internet. You need to be able as a teacher um, or, or an educator to be able to know why something should work or why something doesn't work, to know what is something that you need to take and adapt and change or and, and, and to know how to move and plan and move learning on. So resources vitally important. Um, I actually wrote a book called um, Gifted and Talented in the Early Years. And I wrote it because I was getting so many co phone calls from kindergarten saying, we've got a little bit of money and we want to buy resources for gifted children. And I said, well, I'm delighted you want to do something for your gifted children, but you might not have to spend money. Why don't you look at the resources you've got and think about, think about using them differently? And so I wrote a book that thinks about all the regular things you have in a kindergarten, all the equipment, building blocks, um, the water tree, construction toys, and saying, OK, these are just things lying around. How might we use them? What pedagogy can we develop that will help to challenge the children in our care? If you're interested in thinking about some of these things and thinking about what matters in gifted education, in the introduction, I was introduced um, as being linked to the World Council for Gifted and Talented Children. They have developed um, some principles. I was part of the team that developed this. There was people from all over the globe that developed these. I can't take them and use them as they are on the website. I would have to change the language. If I in Scotland said, used the word gifted, people would go, oh, I'm not sure we can look at this. This is problematic, blah, blah, blah. So again, it's a framework, a principle to get you thinking. Um, I hope you might find those helpful if you're thinking about this as a school, perhaps. Um, and I really would encourage you if you're here as a teacher, is it hard? Oh, Yes, teaching is hard. Is it rewarding? Yes. But embrace teaching, embrace your craft, develop your craft, develop those pedagogical tools that you already have at your disposal. All the knowledge that you have up here as a teacher and put learners at the heart of what you do. That tree is in our cloisters. That's my university there. And it's known as the tree of knowledge. We had some four year old gifted and talented learners in with us one day and we were doing a tour of our campus. And I said to them, this tree is called the tree of knowledge. And they knew what knowledge was. We've been talking about knowledge and they just all ran away over the grass and started hugging the tree. And when I said, what are you doing? I was actually quite worried the janitors might go, why are you on my grass? But I said, what are you doing? And they said, we're trying to get some knowledge. And I have this memory every time I see that tree of these young children, four, four and a half year olds, desperate to get knowledge. And I would encourage you as teachers to constantly be seeking out knowledge, constantly reflecting on what you do in order that you can develop it. It's a challenging job. I'm not denying, I'm not suggesting this isn't is easy. It's not, but it's rewarding. And I would argue that it's a job worth doing. Teaching is hugely important for our young people. Don't lose sight of why you're doing this. 
I use these two pictures here because for me, I remember the day um, when I was with these young children and both of them, the little girl uh, with the water, she had set up this very complex thing and she put poured the water in one end and she ran through to the other to see if the water would travel through. And she had her eureka moment when the water came out. Just look at the smile on her face. Same with the other little girl. She was just so enjoying the activity we were doing. It was quite a challenging activity for the age she was, but she was just loving it. Don't lose sight. We get caught up with the policies and with all the bits of paper maybe you need to fill in, but let's not lose sight of why we do this. We do this because of the learners who should be at the centre, whether that learner is 2, 12, 22, 92 keep them at the centre. They will keep us focused. They will keep us centred. There's a lot you can do as a teacher, but you can't do it alone. I do believe that we need to work together. So learn where to seek support. Don't be afraid to seek support and do this together. Because if this UN document has to mean what it says, then it must include the different, the, the gifted. If every child matters and matters equally, then we can't just split our class into different groups and think about them in separate ways. We need to think about them all. And I wish you well as you do that. And I would now love to hear from you and, and any questions that you may have. I will do my best to answer them. Um, don't make them too difficult. But thank you very much for listening.